Field, I'm Amberly Lerner, and today I'm going to be talking to you about politics. And I know what you're thinking, what's the point about talking about politics? It's politics, it's crazy, like, who wants to get involved in that? But the thing is, we should all want to be involved in politics, because politics affects all of us, whether we're involved or not. It affects us through the bills that Congress passes, it affects us through the executive orders that the President makes, or the troops he chooses to de do deploy. And it affects us even with the Supreme Court when they choose important rulings for the cases that they decide to do. So today I'm going to take all that I learned in AP government, all those months of preparing for the test, and I'm going to cram it down into a half hour for the civics crash course. I'm going to start by talking about the election year because the election is really important and it's also happening this fall. We are currently in the primary season, but we're also towards the end of the primary season, so we kind of know who's going to be facing off in November. For the Republicans, it's Donald Trump. And maybe you're thinking Donald Trump's a senator, or he's a governor, and he's a lot of experience, and he has these very Republican values. But the most ironic thing is that he's not. He's a businessman. You may have even seen him on Celebrity Apprentice. He talks a lot about immigration, and he offends a lot of people, but no one really knows what he's doing besides that, what he, or what he would do if he becomes our president. So before I decided to film this, I decided to go to his website and see what he w was thinking about the issues and what he would do if he became our president. The first issue that I saw on the website was pay for the wall, and the last issue was immigration reform. But there are three issues in between. There's health care, there's taxes, and there's veterans reform. Health care is very much about repealing Obamacare and building this whole new Trump care system. And that sounds nice to a lot of Republicans, but what they don't know is the simple act of repealing the Obamacare and then putting in Trump's new Trump Care program, it would cost billions of dollars and it would bankrupt America even more than it already is. Meanwhile, for taxes, you have him, Donald Trump, wanting to cut down taxes for the middle class which is a very Democrat idea, so I have no idea why he's running for the Republicans. Then you have the veterans, which he seems to be very big on, and he even boycotted a debate just to raise money for the veterans. And you think, you know, that's all grand and stuff, but lately, if you look it up, the charities that Donald Trump so valiantly raised money for haven't gotten the money they are promised. At least, not all of it. And you're wondering, you know, what Donald Trump is doing. Is he making a new Trump Tower? Is he buying Ivanka a boat? Who knows? We don't. So that's the, Demo that's the Republicans. You might be hoping out for a new hope, like Star Wars style, or you might just want someone to come out of the shadows, or whatever, or John Kasich to resurrect once more. But the reality is, though there were 17 people hoping to become the Republican nominee, there is only one man now who will become the nominee, and that is Donald Trump. He's managed to defeat them all. What's still on the side yet is the Democrats. If you look at them, there is a huge margin between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, but if you take an even closer look at them, you'll see that most of that difference is because of superdelegates. And you're wondering, as you look at superdelegates and you looked at pledge delegates, what exactly are superdelegates? And why are there so many of them? And why do they even exist? And the main answer to that question is, superdelegates are delegates unchanged. They don't have to listen to what the voters want. At the national convention, they go and they place their vote on whatever candidate they think is best for the party. And they don't have to listen to anyone else. So, for example, in 2008, they had originally promised to back Hillary Clinton because they figured, well, she's the most experienced and we could have a woman in the White House. And then Barack Obama starts winning. He actually starts winning, even though he's just a, barely been a senator. 
And a lot of the black superdelegates who had originally promised Hillary, the wife of the first black president, were like, wait, we can have an actual black president this time. And at the convention, they changed their votes. What's happening this election is that many are going for Hillary again and are most likely staying for Hillary because Bernie is very radical and therefore it, it wouldn't do well in the general election. So they're deciding to stay behind Hillary because she's most likely to win. You may wonder why we have such a system in place. A lot of that has to do with the 1968 election when Lyndon B. Johnson didn't want to run again because he didn't want to deal with the Vietnam War and the whole Democratic National Convention turned to complete chaos. And after that, they decided they're going to have these superdelegates. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if after this election, the Republicans get some superdelegates of their own. So, what happens if Donald or one of the Democrats gets into office? What are we exactly voting them for, for them to do? And the thing is, while we do know that the president leads the country, there's a lot of hidden bonuses and perks that we really don't know about, but that the, the presidents have and use very, very often. One of them is executive orders. You might have heard it before mentioned in the news, but the biggest question is what are they? Executive orders are directives for the executive branch, which the president is the leader of. And now it makes sense, you know, since he's the leader. But the thing about the executive branch is that it's grown so big mostly thanks to bureaucracy expanding. We can thank Franklin Delano Roosevelt for that. But even so, it's really expanded. So when Barack Obama or George Bush or whoever passes down an executive order, it basically has the effect of a law. And before, it's never really gone unchecked. It could, but it just hasn't. The another way that the president seems to go, OK, so I forgot to mention this, but Executive orders don't have to be passed by Congress. That's the coolest thing about them. They don't have to, like, the opponent has to have to deal with the Republican Congress. He can just say, oh, I will protect all parents of, na na of Hispanic kids born here. And it's a law, and the Republican Congress can complain, but it's still there. And that's a way the president has evaded the checks and balances the Founding Fathers have put in. As I was saying before, another way that the president does this is through executive agreements. Executive agreements are very much like treaties. They're made with another foreign head of state, and they agree to stuff. Mostly, it's over trade. But if America and Mexico really want to crack down on border security, they could get together and make an executive agreement. And the thing that makes these so enticing is that, like executive orders, they don't have to be approved by the Senate. They can just happen. Right now, the, Obama's trying to do that with the Iran nuclear deal. And that's why it's causing so much controversy from the Senate. Lastly, another way that the president has gained in power is through signing statements. So a president gets a bill passed by Congress, and he chooses whether or not to sign it or to veto it. And if he chooses to sign it, he can take parts of the bill, look it over, and say, I don't believe in this, or I don't think it's constitutional, so I'm not going to enforce it. And he writes a statement. George Bush, for example, when faced with this defense spending bill that had a big part that was like, you cannot put troops in Colombia, he was like, well, that's nice, but I'm going to say this is advisory in nature as commander in chief and not put troops in Colombia anyway. So he puts down the science statement and it doesn't go back to Congress to, for their approval. It just goes in and becomes a law. So that's a big way that the president's power has increased. And a lot of that is thanks to their lawyers who have looked at the wording of the Constitution and say, well, based on this wording, you could do this, like executive orders or agreements or whatever, because of your powers as chief diplomat or chief executive. And so that's a really big reason why it's important to, for you to vote. Because if you vote and the person you feel that you want to win or that you feel is most capable, 
we close into office and they have a lot of power. And it's not just nuclear codes they have a lot of power over, it's pretty much this whole country. Another reason why you should vote this year for the president is because the president will choose a lot of Supreme Court justices in the next four years. Right now, we're facing with this exact dilemma. But before I go into that, just a brief example or explanation of how the judicial branch works. Because to be honest, before I took AP Gov permit, I didn't really know a lot about how the Supreme Court works. I just knew that they listened to cases and put down the law and stuff. But there's a little more complexity into how it works. So how it works is the Supreme Court has a bunch of other courts underneath it in the judicial branch. So they have like the district courts, they have the appeals courts, they have state courts, they have bankruptcy courts, randomly. And each of them hears a case. And if the plaintiff or the defendant or whoever feels that the case doesn't treat them fairly, or if it, there's been a mistrial, they can appeal it through a series of courts, which would eventually go to the Supreme Court. But not every case is heard by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court actually takes half of 1% of the petition sent to them. So when they are deciding which cases are, they will take, there's a thing called the Rule of Four, in which the Supreme Court justices vote. And if there are four justices who want to hear a case, they take it automatically. It's four out of nine and not five out of nine to protect the interests of the minorities. But that's basically how the Supreme Court works and how it decides what cases to take. And there's nine justices, but it's, there's technically eight right now. And that brings us to the current situation of the Supreme Court. So we have our justices. We have Anthony Kennedy, we have John Roberts, we have Stephen Breyer, we have Elena Kagan, we have Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor, we have Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we have Samuel Leto, and we have Clarence Thomas, and we used to have Antonin Scalia. And then in February, we didn't have Antonin Scalia. He died really, really suddenly. He wasn't battling cancer. He was just found dead. And People were like, oh my god, we have to get a new Supreme Court justice. And Obama is like, okay, I'll find someone. And he finds Merrick Garland. He's the head of the DC Appeals Court. He's been there for a long time. He's, he went, was on the case for the Oklahoma City bombings. He has a lot of experience. However, the Republican Congress is the one that actually decides whether or not the Supreme Court nominee can actually become a Supreme Court justice. And they decide, since it's an election year, come November, there will be a new president. That new president should pick the new Supreme Court justice, which leads us to the current stalemate we're at. A lot of people have found this very ridiculous. Some people haven't. But a lot of people have also pointed out that there have been a lot of presidents in the 19th century who have picked a candidate for Supreme Court and have had them nominated and proved onto the Supreme Court bench. Woodrow Wilson got not just one, but two people onto the bench and with less time than Obama currently has. When Scalia died, there was 11 months left, nearly a full year until the new president would be sworn into office and therefore able to pick a justice. So that's how, that's our current system right now. If you feel like you want to be involved, you can. The Supreme Court is supposed to be least affected by the press, but there are still ways to get involved with it. You can write to your congressman. The Judiciary Committee in the Senate is the one that decides whether or not to give the Merrick Garland a hearing. And if you write to them, or if you write to any of them in general, there's a very likely chance that if there's some pressure, especially because some of them are up for re-election, they will go through the hearings, and they will give them Merrick Garland a fair hearing. It's better to not do anything at all. Also, if general with cases, you can write an amicus brief if you're interested in a case and send it to the Supreme Court. And that's how your voice can be heard, too. All right, 
So, he talked about the president, he talked about the justices and the Supreme Court and what's going on there. There's another thing that's up for grabs this election, and that is the Congress. Congress is split into two houses. There's the House of Representatives and there's the Senate. And you've probably learned a lot from Schoolhouse Rock already, so I'm not gonna go that much into detail. But the thing you really need to know in relation to this election is the fact that House of Representative members get a term of two years and the senators get a term of six years. So a lot of them are for grabs, specifically the senators. And you're kind of wondering what Congress does because it doesn't seem like they do much lately. In fact, they are so unpopular that you, they were so unpopular that, that in a 2013 poll, traffic jams was more popular than Congress. So really, why would you want to be a senator or a House of representative? However, they do get perks. They have better health benefits that last five years after their term ends. They have better pensions. They ha just have a lot of perks in general, like uh, their own barber shop. And they can hire a bunch of people to actually read the bills for them, so they don't have to spend a lot of time on it. They can just go in and vote. So it seems kind of like a rigged system, as Bernie Sanders would say. But it is still important to learn about Congress, because the more we know about Congress, the more we can hold them to their duty. So how does Congress work? It gets a lot of bills that it can possibly turn to laws. In fact, thousands of bills are given to Congress each year. They are filtered through a committee system. So the House has its own set of committees from like appropriations to judiciary to intelligence. And also the Senate has a bunch of other committees too. And the bills go through the committees and the subcommittees. And if they get through the committee, they go to onto the floor. It's here where things get a little different between the two houses of Congress. The Senate, there's no major rules other than the fact that you can filibuster, which means talk for a really, really, really long time. Ted Cruz, the former candidate in the Republican primary, got his claim to fame by filibustering Obamacare and shutting down the government. His filibuster lasted 23 hours, and included him reading bedtime stories to his kids. With the House, though, it's a little different. There is no filibustering because there is 435 members, so that would be really, really long. And because there are 435 members, there are more rules. In fact, there's a whole committee to it. There's a rules committee in which when the bill comes to the floor, they decide how long people speak, how many people speak, and whether or not there could be amendments. It's a very powerful committee, so a lot of congressmen want to eventually be on that committee but they decide, and that can be manipulated depending on party lines if you really wanna go down that, card, that road. But point being, eventually goes onto the floor, it's discussed, and then it's sent to the president. A lot of people think that the Senate, this upcoming election might possibly go back to the Democrats, but that's not necessarily for the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives will probably stay Republican, and that's because of gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is something that happens every 10 years. It happens when you take a population census, and each state has to take one, and they're very vigorous about it. They want to count everyone, legal and illegal, in their state, so they can have a large number to give to the national census people. And upon the numbers they got, depending on how much your population rose or declined, you either keep the amount of representatives you have in the House, lose a representative, or gain a representative. And if you lose or gain a representative, you have to redraw district lines to make room for the either additional or loss of the district. So when that happens, the state legislators get together and they're like, well, we need to benefit our party. So both Democrats and Republicans draw lines so it'll benefit their party and so they can get the most votes in Congress. That seems a little ridiculous. And another way you can fight back against that is proposing independent committees. 
like independent completely of state legislatures so that the people can decide, not just the politicians, how their districts are going to be. All right, so I went over the president, I ran over the election, I went over the Supreme Court, and I went over Congress. And now you're like, what should I do now before November? First of all, if you're not registered to vote, you should register, and you should register soon. I personally didn't register on time for the local election. I was not within the 20-day mark, and I thought I could vote, but I guess I couldn't. Ivanka Trump and the other siblings of Donald Trump, sibling of Donald Trump, or children of Donald Trump, I should say, could not vote for their father in the election because they did not register six months ahead of the election. And that's the New York rule, and that's why they couldn't vote for him. So that's just an example of one of the many ways registering to vote is very hard in our country. However, it's very worthwhile, so it's important to be familiar with the guidelines of registering and to get on them as soon as possible if there are any deadlines. Also, another reason why it's really important to vote, in the primaries, most of the states are proportional. They look at the votes that Hillary got and Bernie got, or the votes that Donald Trump got, or Ted Cruz, or Marco Rubio, whoever, and they d distribute the, di the delegates appropriately based on those numbers. However, general elections are very different. Excuse me. General elections are winner take all, and that means that whoever gets the most votes wins. And that's not a majority, that's the most votes. So Donald Trump could have 32% of the people vote for him, but if he beats out Hillary's 31%, and then like a third party's like remaining percent, he could still be the president. Because when you have a winner take all election, you have all, like but just by one vote even, one vote more than the other person, and you get the whole state's delegates. And that's why it's really important to vote, because you could be that one vote. All right, thanks for joining me today. I know it's not the most exciting topic, but it's really important, so I thank you for staying through the Civics Crash Course. <laughs>